welcome to my lecture on metabolism. Metabolism has to do with all of the chemical reactions inside the cells of a living thing and the energy of those reactions. You may be well aware of the concept of your own metabolism because it may cause you to be preoccupied with your weight. Some claim to have a slow or high metabolism depending on their ability to gain or lose weight. This can be a direct result of the foods that you eat or the amount of exercise that you get. These two things definitely have something to do with your own metabolism. But your metabolism is regulated by a gland in your neck called the thyroid gland and its secretions of the thyroid hormone. Graves' disease, otherwise known as hyperthyroidism, is a common metabolic disease where too much thyroid hormone is released. And hypothyroidism is the opposite of that. But this lecture is not about the thyroid gland or controlling your weight. It's about the metabolic activity at the cellular level. As I've said before, you can understand how an organism works by first understanding how its cells work. There are two kinds of metabolic reactions in cellular activity. An anabolic reaction involves building larger molecules from smaller ones. Dehydration is a great example of an anabolic reaction. Anabolic reactions are endergonic, meaning that they absorb energy, and the products have more energy than the reactants did. Catabolic reactions involve breaking down larger molecules into smaller ones. Hydrolysis is a great example of a catabolic reaction because catabolic reactions are always exergonic, meaning that they release energy and the reactants have less energy than the products. Dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis are just examples of metabolic reactions, but there are many more that occur in the cells of organisms. We'll be investigating some of these throughout the course. But let's start with the basics and define energy. As you may have learned in physics, energy is the ability to do work. But that's the simple definition. There's a lot more to it here. Let's start to construct our understanding of energy for life. You may know from physics again that there are two kinds of energy. Potential energy, which is stored energy. The energy in the bonds of molecules of food have stored or potential energy. Sometimes we call it chemical energy. And then there's kinetic energy. When the bonds in food molecules are broken, energy is released. This energy powers the work of the cell and therefore the work of the organism. Organisms use energy for basically three things. To grow, to move, and to reproduce. Growth involves mitosis, the division of cells. Movement is necessary to obtain more energy. And reproduction is a biological imperative that requires lots of energy. I wonder if you ever knew why some plants use so much of their energy making lots of beautiful flowers. The purpose is reproduction, of course. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me get back to the basic examples of potential and kinetic energy. I think you can follow this. Due to gravity, a diver high up on a platform has more potential energy than if he is down in the water. Diving converts the potential energy into kinetic energy and the work of moving him toward the water. When he hits the water, the kinetic energy dissipates into the water as a splash and ripples move out from him. The act of climbing is kinetic energy. As he climbs the steps, his kinetic energy is converted back into potential energy. Both forms of energy can be converted one into the other. Now back to metabolism. An exergonic reaction proceeds with a net release of energy and is spontaneous. What does that mean? Well, once it's started, it will continue on its own. Free energy is in the environment that is available to do work. Remember, catabolic reactions are exergonic. An endergonic reaction absorbs free energy and is non-spontaneous, meaning that unless energy is continually fed into the reaction, it will stop. Sort of like electricity going into my hair dryer. Without the electricity to the dryer, it won't work and I'll have a bad hair day. Remember, anabolic reactions are endergonic. For a graphic representation, we can look here. The reactants have more chemical potential energy stored in its bonds. As the reaction progresses, the energy is released, 
and becomes free energy. The symbol for free energy is the letter G. So delta G means the net change in free energy. The products have less energy. And that free energy is then available to do work, the work of the cell. You know that these reactions, although spontaneous, need a little coaxing with a little input of energy called activation energy, denoted by the symbol capital E subscript A. They need this little push before they'll continue spontaneously. But still, the net change in energy is the same. The product lost that energy. The opposite is true for an endergonic reaction. Free energy must be continually put into the system and into the reactants to drive the reaction forward. The products absorb that energy and store it as chemical potential energy in the bonds formed by the products. Endergonic reactions have an activation energy too, as depicted by this graphic. But where do your cells get the energy to drive an endergonic reaction and to activate both endergonic and exergonic? Well, it appears to be from an energy molecule that all organisms can make, and that is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Here's what the molecule looks like. Let's get a little familiar with it. It's made up of adenine, a nitrogenous base, bonded by a 5-carbon sugar called ribose, and then three phosphate units. With the help of enzymes, cells will detach this last phosphate group and attach it to reactants in a reaction. We say that the reactants are phosphorylated. The phosphate group greatly destabilizes the reactant, which increases its chemical energy and forces the reactants to react. Where does the cell get this ATP? Well, it's made by cells using one of two methods, either by plants and algae or some bacteria in the process of photosynthesis and respiration. An organism that can do both is considered an autotroph. And these organisms, like plants, are pretty self-sufficient because they can capture the light energy from the sun, use it to make some ATP, also use it to drive the endergonic reaction of photosynthesis, which makes chemical energy. That chemical energy is then used in the process of respiration to make lots of ATP. We'll tackle photosynthesis and respiration in some subsequent videos. But now I hope you have a little bit better understanding of what metabolism is at the cellular level. We'll see you back in class. If you have any questions, make sure you bring them up then. Thanks a lot. Well, all the parties on the streets I talk and store from mannequins sleeping in lights. We used to smoke while we were jaywalking like it was your birthday every other Saturday night. Knew the band, so we never paid our cover. Wrote our names on the bathroom.